Wow, here we are again, folks. It's Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. Do you know life in a regular, ordinary, everyday life is crossing bridges? We're crossing bridges every day, some type of bridge. We cross financial bridges. We cross bridges of hunger and, and fill that bridge with eating something. Uh, we cross over some bridges that expanse across a great body of water. That the only other way you could get across would be by <clears throat> originally by canoe and then by boat and, and then nowadays by plane or uh, a bridge crossing that same body of, of water for a train. And, but they also have bridges for cars and people that you can cross a, a gulf that has to be crossed. Well, Adam <clears throat> was the one that caused the first bridge to have to be made to now cross a bridge to God where originally God made it without a bridge. Adam could come to God any way he wanted to, any time he wanted to. But now he has to have a bridge of righteousness. We have to have a bridge of righteousness because as we are finishing up now in our Old Testament uh, survey and summary, just a little bit of summary, and about the last three or four excerpts have been a summary of uh, Adam. But we saw in Genesis 2.17 where Adam brought forth death. And because he and Eve sinned, they brought forth death. Otherwise, they were created as beings that would live with God forever. And then they brought forth the fact that naked, that they were naked. And he brought forth nakedness which showed that man now knew what sin really was and what a sinful life was. And that was a curse on man. So Adam and Eve brought a curse on man by deliberately uh, doing opposite of what God said to do. And that curse brought a thing called sorrow. There wasn't before uh, Adam and Eve sinned, there was no such a thing as sorrow. Every day was bliss. And... Uh, was good. And then he brought forth some things called thorns. Do you know that the rose that grew in that day had no thorns on it? There were no thorns and there were no thistles. There were no thorns and thistles. Thorns and thistles came after the fall of man, after Adam sinned. And then sweat. Adam was not designed to sweat. He was designed to live comfortably in the garden every day in total leisure and a total fellowship with God. God came down in early in the day and walked with Adam and uh, in the cool of the day and walked with Adam. And he'll still do that with you today, by the way, if you ask him to and uh, to come. And, uh, and then we also see that it brought a sword. And the type of sword it's talking about here is a sword of separation. Now, uh, the, uh, we see pictures of the old Roman guard with that sword hanging on his side, and he pulled it out. We see all through the Old Testament that the, the weapon of the day in the Old Testament was the sword, and that they used that sword and knew how to use it and knew how to defend with it and how to go out and win a battle with it. And that is called the physical sword. But the sword here, too, that we see that Adam found out there is a sword today you and I have, which is the Word of God. The sword that you and I use today is the Word of God. It's a sword that cuts in and cuts on the way out. And that's the Word of God. It cuts in. Thou shalt not steal. It cuts in and you hear that and you pull the sword on and from then on you don't steal. You don't lie. You don't cheat. You don't do those things anymore. And that's what this sword, the sword of the Word does. Now, and we see over in the New Testament, we'll get into that next time. But right now we're dealing with the things that the curse brought. And those things that was brought upon man and the fivefold judgment of sin upon man. And he, he was now, he had to toil. See, before then, all he had to do was walk around in the garden. Jesus did everything. God did everything in the garden. And so all Adam had, he could just walk around. But now God said, you got to toil by the sweat of your face. And then uh, uh, suffering in childbirth, he brought upon the woman. There was not going to be suffering in childbirth originally. 
but now there is. I think one of our biggest problems in this day and age is that they've introduced the C-section and women today are, are just normally, they don't go get it because they have to. They go get it because they want to because it alleviates that suffering. If you don't have that suffering, you don't have that love for that child and that bond that you would have and neither does that child have that bond with you that he would have if you suffered in that childbearing. That was, a, that was actually a, a tough thing, but it was a gift from God to make that bond that you need with that child. And uh, uh, the suffering in childbirth is uh, called subordination to men. And it's, it's really where you have, that brings that tie that binds Without that suffering, you don't have that tie that binds. And that's why people are throwing children away today. They mean nothing to them, and they just throw them away. Uh, upon the nature, thorns and thistles came then. And that was something now, not did man only have to do the sweat of his brow, but he had to deal with thorns and thistles and stuff of nature that wasn't there. Uh, aimlessness. Upon the serpent, the devil has an aimless life for those people who will follow him. It's totally aimless. We're living in a day today where we see total families uh, totally dispersed and uh, by the aimless living of taking dope. Just pills after pills after pills or something. Just staying sedated. Not, you'll be, you've brought yourself to a place to where you are completely 100% worthless uh, it would be better to take a gun and shoot you, get you out of the way, than it would to have you uh, go through that life, destroy your family, destroy the life of your children, destroy the life of those around you, become a thief, become everything. I know this because we have it in our family as close as family. And so we've seen it, and we know how it works, and we know it is destructive. And it's just a way the serpent the devil is using to destroy things today. And then we saw the uh, one of the things, that the thorns and thistles are aimlessness. Now, the things that people do today, robbing, stealing, murder, cheating, dope, and all that, are aimless things. They have no aim. They, they're aimless. And they have no real meaning for a prosperous good life, like following Jesus Christ is a prosperous good life. It is a life with an aim. It is an arrow you aim and you shoot and you follow it into a good place. So upon the serpent now would crawl upon his belly. This was the curse there. And that he would bite the heel of man and man would stomp his head. And uh, so we see that for, for sin, it's aimless. It has no direction. It can go any direction, and every direction it goes, it falls off a cliff. It's not any good. <coughs> and then we see that he told this upon Satan to suffer a fatal head wound. Satan is going to suffer a fatal head wound just like us, stomping, stomping the serpent when he said that the Son of Man would stomp his head. He was talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, coming on the earth, being born of a virgin, going to the grave, having victory over Satan, taking all the captives that are uh, down there in the, in the heart of the earth, those that were in paradise to heaven, leaving the heart of the earth to the devil and to his saints and his people that... Uh, Let's see, he, uh, God promised a Savior to Adam. And uh, he removed Adam from that original pleasant garden was kind of a heavenly abode. Uh, first thing you saw, God sought Adam out every morning. He sought him out and he see searches you out every morning. God searches you out every day. If you're laying in bed and you have a fleeting thought, there's a God. And very few people today even do that. 
And back in the olden days, uh, everybody worshipped God morning, noon, and night. It was a regular, regular thing. I can say that I fail myself. My wife said to me something a little while ago about our prayer life was not up to par, and it's not. And we fail in areas as human beings. And those failures cause us to not have the proper communication that we need to have with God. So we need to, if we want that redemptive conscience, that God redeemed us from sin, gave us a God conscience, then we must be conscious of God at all times. We must be conscious of God. But the fourfold grace of God was that redemption from sin. And, and that he, he gave us this redemption from sin. And that we could uh, come along <coughs> and uh, follow him. Uh, that, see, we saw upon the woman who was put that sorrow. <coughs> In the redemption of sin, there is some tribulation. Tribulation to the flesh, not tribulation to the spirit. A tribulation to the flesh, meaning that you leave off some of those things that you considered pleasure, they're gone. Now, if you allow God to take them away, they're not something you still desire. If you still desire them, then you haven't crossed the bridge. We're talking about bridges when we first started. You haven't, talked, you haven't crossed the bridge of salvation. If you want to cross the bridge of salvation, you've got to put away those things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. I don't have it on me. The pride of life, you have to put all that away. And if you don't put that away, then you, don't, uh, you haven't crossed that bridge yet. So, you need to cross that bridge of salvation. And uh, as you cross that bridge of salvation, God will come and give you the life where you don't have to live in the thorns and the thistles. <laughs> you don't have to live in a barbaric life. You're looking at a man at the age of 30 had drank some, for some 15 years, become an alcoholic, a cusser, and a, a rebel, and everything else. And, but God came and saved me instantly. And I've never, ever returned to any one of those things, the cussing or the drinking. There have been many other things I've had to deal with in my life that I had practices of before I got saved. But I'm telling you that God took Adam out of that perfect place, put him in a place of walking thorns and thistles. He takes us out of the place of work walking in the thorns and thistles of the devil's desire for us into a place of walking in righteousness which is what we have to do. You see that Adam attempted to hide himself. Well, I'll get it in a minute. Adam attempted to uh, hide himself from God, but you can't do that. If Once you ask God into your heart to save your soul, he's in you permanently forever. You can't hide from him. You can't go do things outside of that. You notice that Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God, uh, chapter 3 and verse 8. This ultimate tragic result of sin not only separates man from God, but makes him actually desire to hide from God. So, here it is Sunday morning, and you decide, I don't think I'm going to go to church today. Why? You know why? You're hiding from God. You don't want to go and get revealed to you by the preacher your sin for the week, where you've been, what you've done, what you haven't done. And the preacher's going to get up there and say, have you prayed this week? Have you sang this week? Have you fellowship with God this week? Or have you done everything you've done in what the devil would have you do? And so uh, this is what, where we live today. Uh, Adam was delivered into a place where there was thorns and thistles and everything else but then God had to show him <coughs> what to do to get out of that <coughs> we're going to in our next excerpt we're going to talk about the greatest human being that was ever born on the earth his name is Jesus 
Christ. He is the first fruit of all that are saved. He is the first fruit of righteousness that can come in you and I and live on this earth in a fleshly body. That's, that righteousness came in Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that in a bit. We see that degradation came through Adam. Adam's sin, let's look. He became the first human sinner. That's one of the first things he did. And Adam and Eve first, <clears throat> uh, theologically, Adam uh, is declared by the New Testament to be the original sinner. So he was the first sinner that ever was. This was a perfect creation God made, and the devil came along and made him imperfect by making him a sinner. The reason for Adam was that he was the head of the human race and therefore responsible for his actions. He was the head. Eve was not the head. Eve, if you please, <clears throat> was uh, second to the head. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Romans 5 and 12 says, For all had sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, through his subility, sub, sub, <coughs> he, was, he was a subtle creature. His subtleness brought it so, the mind, so your minds could be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 11.3. See, the devil's subtle in that he draws you away from the spiritual, and then the simplicity of the scripture draws you to it. How simple is it? Jesus, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. And he does. That's how simple it is. That's what I did at 3 o'clock in the morning, November 5th, 1972. And been saved ever since. And that, that's all it takes. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression, 1 Timothy 2.14. What are you saying, Brother Peter? I'm saying that Adam knew if he did not sin, if he did not partake of that fruit, he would not have that woman. Well, you say, what was the second choice? Nobody knows that. God is God, and God knows things that nobody else knows. It has never been revealed to mankind. What, what plan God would have had. But God never planned for a man to have a second wife. That's never been in God's plan. God's plan said when a man and woman are married, they become one. And as one, they are one. And when they get to heaven, they're going to be one. And that's why it's not in God's plan for man to marry twice, to have a second wife. His plan is that man marries one time, has one woman, and that's it. That's God's plan. But the devil comes along and sows the seed of wild uh, permissiveness for a man just to go out and be, satisfy his own self and his own pleasure. So therefore, he puts away a woman <clears throat> and gets another woman. Never was in the design. I got to get out of that. Now I'm meddling and preaching a, a message that's uh, for today, but not in this particular setting. All right. He attempts at first to hide his nakedness from God. Uh, apparently, uh, some uh, drastic change occurred concerning Adam's physical as well as his spiritual condition. It may be that the bodies of Adam and Eve were at that particular time of creation covered with a soft light. Remember our, our Savior, uh, the Lord Jesus, was clothed with light brighter than the sun during the transfiguration. In other words, Clothes do not go into the kingdom of heaven. When you enter the kingdom of heaven, you're going to enter with the glory of God on your body. You're not going to have one piece of clothing. 
clothing is a product, if you please, of the devil in a sense that it's a physical handmade thing that covers the body. And it's not going into heaven. When you go into heaven, you're going to go uh, as a baby would, naked. But now this uh, <clears throat> protection is gone in the, the uh, uh, desperate effort uh, to correct the situation they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. Remember, they made the first clothes. <laughs> Adam and Eve made the first clothes in the Garden of Eden with fig leaves. That's what they had to use, and that's what they used. But but look at the uh, look at the uh, <clears throat> smartness or the intelligence of human being. He was made with that. He was made with an intelligence to name the trees and the animals, the birds and the bees and the air and everything else he named it. Can you imagine the brain that was in that man? We have a computer today. I think our computer today would be lame compared to what Adam knew. And, and so, uh, uh, so Adam was the smartest th thing on the earth. All right. Now, and now we have the first example of man-made religion in history. Religion, religion, is an attempt to clothe ourselves apart from the righteousness of Christ. Religiosity, religion, uh, not speaking uh, downward or slang-wise to, but there are many, many, many religions today that do not point to Jesus Christ, that do not point to heaven. They point to a worldwide system of a religion that makes you feel good and doesn't do anything for you for the long term, for the long haul of eternity. Therefore, those religions, all those people in all those big religions that exclude Christ from their religion will not go to heaven. They will die and go to hell. They are not saved. Religiosity or religiality or religious living does not is not what is spiritual living. Spiritual living is not necessarily what you would call religious living. It is spiritual living. Adam and Eve sewed those fig leaves together. Man today try to educate themselves with church membership, baptisms, tithing, confirmation, good works, etiquette but all to no avail. Wow. If you're tithing, just because God said to put your 10% in, and you do it grudgingly, it's not counted for you as a, as a thing. Very important thing, though. Very important thing. Tithing is very important. Uh, tithing is what keeps the heat on, what keeps the lights on, what pays the salaries to 10 or 12 people running the church, what does... All the things. Tithing is the means that God uses for it. But you know that our righteousness is like filthy rags? If we're doing it that men would see it and give us glory, then it's filthy rags. And we all fade out like a leaf in the fall blowing off the tree. And, uh, and, and we're not going to be of any use really in the future to come because we'll be in hell burning. Our iniquities are like the wind that have taken us away. Isaiah 64, 6. He said, isn't that something? You can live your 50, 60, 70 years and have nothing but hell to come to at the end of it. You say, well, I've been a good person. I, I've, I've tied, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that. Yeah. But God said, I didn't know you. Those were just all works. You can do good works and die and go to hell because those works aren't going to get you to heaven. Asking Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin, come in your heart and save your soul, is going to get you to heaven. Otherwise, you aren't going to heaven. See, Adam attempted to hide himself from God. But that was an attempt. And it didn't work. We have an attempt sometimes to hide ourselves in 
doing things that are not, they look good, but they're not. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, chapter 3 and 8. This ultimately was a tragic result of sin, and not only separated man from God, but makes him actually desire to hide from God. This cannot be done. <laughs> You can't hide from God. There's no way you can hide from God. O oh God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Psalm 69, 5. David said, I thought I was hiding from you, God, but last night I was laying awake there, looking at the stars, hearing the sheep, uh, uh, lightly moaning, and, and thinking, and I was uh, talking to you, and you showed me something. That everything in my heart is known to you. That everything in my life is known to you. And that I can't hide anything from you. I've got to be totally honest with you and plain. If I want fellowship with you. And David got fellowship. Do you know when David lost his fellowship? When he sinned and didn't and didn't and denied it. If you sin and deny it, then it becomes a plague. One of those thorns and one of them thistles. But if you sin and say, God forgive me, I sin, instantly God will forgive you. You say, Well, what if I deliberately sin? Well, most sin is deliberate. Most sin is deliberate. And uh, so if you deliberately sin, God will forgive you for that. But you know, there's consequences. There's always consequences for things. You say, well, well, I'm going to sin without consequence. No, you're not sinning without consequence. You're going to have consequence if you sin. And there's going to be a consequence. I, I face them every day. I face some consequences every single day from sin. I face them. And I have them come. If I do a sin and I don't got confess it immediately and get it out of the way, it's consequences. Uh, it might be a guilty conscience that just keeps plaguing you. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bond man, wow, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and sat under the mountains and rocks Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Revelation 6, 15 through 17. Read it. That's the ultimate end of the person who has not given themselves to God. These people right here that are talking knew about God. They knew about God. And they, were, they knew now they were in the presence of God, but they don't know how to hide. They can't hide. They have no hiding place. There is no hiding place from God. God's always after you. Always wanting you to fellowship with Him. He made mankind a fellowship with him. The glory around his throne is not the angels out there who are worshiping him, but is the mankind worshiping him by following. And the glory of that man go, comes up before the throne of God. We are in a mirror of God. God has a great mirror before him called the sea, crystal sea. This gray crystal sea is a lake. On top of that lake, it shines. The brightness of God shines on the top of that lake. What's in that lake? I believe that this, all the sins of mankind who have said, God, forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save my soul, were cast into the lake of forgetfulness. I just believe that's the lake of forgetfulness in front of God. And all he can see on top of that lake is the sun shining. He can't look down into that lake. He said, your sins are gone as far as the east from the west, never ever more to be remembered. 
You will not be condemned for sin that's been confessed. So confess your sin. Get it out of your life. Get it out of your way. Get it out of your place. Our time's come and gone. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.